Father, again, we thank you for this morning, Lord, and we thank you for the, just for the ability and the freedom that we have still to come and to worship you, Lord. Lord, the confidence that we can pray and we can ask. Lord, the pleasure, the privilege, Lord, of praising you in public about the things that you're doing. And Lord, still, Lord, still, we have the freedom to open your word and to proclaim it. And so, Lord, let us not take that for granted. Many of our brothers and sisters across the world don't have that freedom. And, Lord, we don't know how long ours will last. And so, Lord, while we have it, let us proclaim it and let us prepare for the days that maybe we don't and still we would ask for boldness in that. And so, Lord, as we open your word this morning, we just ask that you would shine a light upon it, Lord. Guide us down that path where you want us to go so that we can hear you clearly. And so we yield to your Spirit's work here this morning, and we do so in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, I was sharing with a couple of the brothers this morning, and this will get to our teaching, obviously, but, you know, we've been going through the Psalms on Wednesday night. And if you're familiar with the Psalms or you've been going with us on this journey it's amazing how much in those psalms that the wicked are talked about. And in the teachings that I've been doing on those, my focus has been down the road where I know, and you should know, by the witness of Scripture, the wicked will be dealt with once and for all. But I had a conviction this morning as I was just thinking about things, in particular current events, and, and I realize that I have to shift my focus a bit, and I want to make sure that you're with me in that, because the wicked are being dealt with. It's not just in the end. You know, God may be bringing some heat upon his church, which we deserve, um, and is definitely pressuring the people of our country, especially those that are in their right mind, whether they're believers or not. But the wicked are being dealt with. And Jesus promises us in his word that the nothing that's done in secret, nothing that's done in secret that won't be revealed. And I believe a reckoning is coming. Even before his return, I believe we'll see the reckoning of some sort um, because people are waking up. People are waking up. And, and we see a lot of countries realizing that and turning away from what they've been doing. And I don't know how long, but I don't think it will be too much longer before we do. There's a lot of pain to come yet. These next few years, I think, are going to be really tough. But I just want to remind us of that. And in particular, when we were doing worship, we were singing that song that I think was one of the first worship songs I remember as a baby Christian, and that's the Refiner's Fire. And I love that image. I've always loved that image. And you've probably heard me teach on it before, but I think to be reminded you know, that image of God's fire under his people, under his church. And when you look back at the, you know, the silversmith or the goldsmith that would have in the old times been in the process of purifying that metal, you know, the cauldron with the fire underneath melting down that precious metal. And then his job was to tend that molten metal. And they would have a ladle of sorts. And, and as the impurities, because of the fire, would raise to the top, they called that the dross. And they would take off the dross and get rid of it. And he would continue that process of, of, of refining that until, and his measurement was, when he could look into the surface of the molten metal and see his reflection. And I just want us to understand that the fires are hot right now. You know, under us as believers, under the church at large, and I think we need to celebrate that refining, to not fear it, and to remind ourselves, remind each other that that's the process that we're in, that he is refining us. And I would have to think, and I've never been a smith over metals, but I believe there's probably a time where that person makes a decision to increase the heat. You know, and we have that other image from Scripture, too, of, God being the potter and us the clay. And, and, and you know, when, when he's spinning that clay on the wheel, he, 
The faster he spins it, the more pressure he has to apply to get the shape out of the clay that he determines. And so let us not give too much credit to the wicked in what we're going through. Let us make us, we need to be clear that it's God's work in us, that he is refining us, that he is shaping us, that he's bringing on the heat, but at the same time, he is bringing that heat in ways that we don't even see most of the time against the wicked. They're not getting away with it, and we need to remember that. So let's turn to our word this morning. We did the first half of this chapter, 1 Corinthians 14, by the way. We did the first half of this chapter last week. And in that first part of this chapter, we saw Paul begin to build a contrast for us between the gift of tongues and the gift of prophecy. And, you know, one could ask, and I I even shared this with the brothers this morning, when I think about all that's going on right now, there's so many things that I'd like to come in here and talk about, but we have to go forward in the Word, and we must go forward in the Word, and we must always realize that we're in it where we're at for a purpose, and God's going to have His way by His Word. But sometimes I think, Lord, I mean, with everything going on, I'm talking about tongues. I'm talking about prophecy. Well, yes, I am, because we teach systematically through the Word, and that's what's in front of us right now. But I want us to also, as we go back into this topic, make sure that we realize underlying it is really God's instruction to us about what he wants from his church, how it's to look and how it's not to look. And that's really the important thing. Not that the gifts aren't important, but that's just what God used as a vehicle to bring a deeper teaching. But last week we saw Paul demonstrate that there were two specific priorities in this teaching. One was that there be order in a church service. And the second was that there would always be an effort towards edifying, building up each other, building up the body of believers. So by inspiration of the Holy Spirit, Paul taught that prophecy speaks to people, but tongues to God. And we discussed last Sunday how important it is to understand that truth about tongues because that way we recognize when it's being used wrongly. Tongues are not a supernatural communication from a person to a person. Instead, it's from a person to God. And that's why an accurate interpretation of tongues will always be addressed to God and not to the people. And I know we went over this last week. Some of you weren't here but I want to reiterate it because I think that's an emphasis because many of you have been in places, have experienced when it's been used wrongly, and some of you grew up in persuasions where you still may wonder, was it right what I saw, what I experienced? So an accurate interpretation of the gift of tongues will either be a prayer or a praise or some communication to God. And that interpretation is another gift of the Spirit, the ability to do that. And sometimes it can come from the person who actually has the gift of tongues. They can interpret what they've spoken. But on the other hand, a believer who prophesies, shares the word with the church, helps those that hear it to understand it, A believer who prophesies edifies, he builds up, encourages, and brings comfort. And a believer who prophesies may include a message of words that foretell or that foreshadow future events. But most importantly, a believer that prophesies speaks in the language of the people. And that's a major difference between the two gifts. And the bottom line here, I'm going to jump all the way to the end of the chapter to make it and then come back. Verse 40 there in your text, the second part of it. Let all things be done decently and in order. And last week, I don't know if I said it, but I thought it. I thought, you know, I'm just going to teach that one verse and move on. It would have been a lot easier. And we're going to talk a lot more about that verse when we get to it this morning. So again, just so we're clear, the very two specific priorities of this teaching is to understand that the Holy Spirit through Paul is bringing this message that there's to be order in the church service and that it should be its focus edifying, building up the body of believers. 
Look at verse 22, where we'll begin. Therefore, tongues are for a sign, not to those who believe, but to unbelievers. But prophesying is not for unbelievers, but for those who believe. Now, you're going to have to have grace this morning towards me and mercy. Because with that verse, we come to probably one of the most difficult passages in the New Testament. And when we simply read that verse, we hear Paul plainly say, tongues are assigned to unbelievers, prophecy assigned to those who believe. So what's the problem? Well, let's read the next three verses. Therefore, if the whole church comes together in one place and all speak with tongues, and there come in those who are uninformed or unbelievers, will they not say that you are out of your mind? But if all prophesy and an unbeliever or an uninformed person comes in, he is convinced by all, he is convicted by all, and thus the secrets of his heart are revealed. And so, falling down on his face, he will worship God and report that God is truly among you. So let me summarize those three verses. If unbelievers hear tongues in a meeting, they will not be blessed, but will say you're out of your mind. And if unbelievers hear prophecy and are convicted in their hearts, their reaction may be to worship God and report that God is truly among you. So I don't know if you caught the difficulty, but there is a difficulty here. And I'm going to do my best to take us through it and not lose you (laughs) or confuse you. And confusion is not from the Lord, so... We won't let the enemy in here. So, in verses 23 through 25, Paul appears to indicate the tongues are not beneficial in ministering to unbelievers, why prophecy is. So the difficult question before us is this. If verse 23 through 25 are true, how then can tongues at the same time be assigned to unbelievers and prophecy be a sign better suited for believers, as we read in verse 22. You following? There seems to be a contradiction between verse 22 and verses 23 through 25. That doesn't happen in Scripture. There aren't contradictions, so there must be an explanation. Now, can we be certain of the explanation? With some certainty, but not completely, but we're going to do our best to try to sort this out. Believe me, I would love to have just skip this. I would love to have just read really fast and hope you didn't notice. But most of you have been through this teaching before, and maybe you didn't go this deep in figuring it out, but we're going to try a little bit here. So what are our options for understanding this? Well, maybe Paul is saying that tongues are actually a sign to unbelievers, but not a positive sign. That's an option. I've read about that option. Because remember last week we talked about unknown tongues and the comparison was the Assyrians in Isaiah's day. And they came speaking a foreign tongue and it was a sign of judgment. If we think about it that way, tongues indeed are a sign to unbelievers. But it's a sign that condemns them as they regard those speaking in tongues as being out of their minds. Others think, and I tend to go this way, others think the real problem here is an error made by a scribe who copied this verse wrong very early in the history of the Bible. For example, there's a well-respected translator named J.B. Phillips, and he thinks an ancient scribe mixed up Paul's word order in verse 22. Now, it's really important to understand when I said that 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 man, and if I'm to agree with him, me also, is not saying that the Holy Spirit made an error. That some scribe who copied it may have just got things out of word order. And that makes a lot of people nervous. A lot of people won't even teach what I just said because it starts to open up a, you know, a door to like, well, how, well, what else is wrong? I'm not saying things wrong as the Holy Spirit gave it, but... We have to understand there were the hands of man involved. But that's also why there's no contradictions, because just about any place that people claim there's a contradiction, there is an explanation. And that's what we're trying to do our best to find right now. So a good principle, and please, I hope some of you learn from this, a good principle for Bible students is to interpret what is hard to understand 
in light of what's easier to understand. So verses 23 through 25 are easier to understand because it's easy to see how an unbeliever hearing Christians speaking in tongues might say that you're out of your mind. It's also easy to see that prophecy could convict the heart of an unbeliever, causing them to repent, to worship God, and report that God is truly among that group of people. So, while we may not exactly understand what Paul means by tongues are a sign, not to those who believe but unbelievers, we know he does not mean tongues minister to or edify unbelievers. Because in them, the Holy Spirit is absent, and that's not possible. Tongues do nothing to bring the unbeliever closer to God. They may instead turn them off. Okay, so take a deep breath. Clear your head. That's as far as we're going to go in that academic exercise. But here's what I don't want to happen. I don't want to let that discussion we just had overshadow what I think is one of the best descriptions in Scripture of a functional, effective church. And let's read that again. If all prophesy and an unbeliever or an uninformed person comes in, he is convicted by all, he is convinced by all, and thus the secrets of his heart are revealed, and so falling down on his face, he will worship God and report that God is truly among you. I always think of that picture. That's always kind of very key in my heart when I consider the church, our church that that would be the experience of an unbeliever, an unknowledgeable person about the things of God and the word of God that would come in and see that we are speaking from truth, speaking God's word, sharing in God's work, and just by our witness of who we are, how we conduct ourselves in the language that we use, that the Lord would work on their hearts through that, that we truly would be the witnesses we're called to be. Not that we would bring it about because we did a certain thing, because we knew they were in the room. No, just because that's who we are. And that's what this church looks like. And really, I think that's just the model that Jesus had for his church. Look at verse 26. How is it then, brethren, whenever you come together, each of you has a psalm, has a teaching, has a tongue, has a revelation, has an interpretation, let all things be done for edification. And again, that word edify just means to build up. So Paul gives us a glimpse here of what things were like when the early church came together. And it appears the meetings were very informal and free. There was liberty for the Spirit of God to use the various gifts which he had given to the church. One man, for instance, would read a psalm, and then another would set forth some teaching. Another would speak in a tongue. Another would present a revelation which he had received directly from the Lord. Another would interpret the tongue that had already been given. And we see here in the way Paul writes that he gives tacit approval to this open meeting where there was liberty for the Spirit of God to speak through believers. But having stated this, he sets forth the first control in the exercise of these gifts. He says everything must be done with a view to edification, a view to building others up. And we can easily picture how this would work among the Corinthian Christians because out of necessity, they were meeting in small groups in different homes. There were many house churches during that time frame and they were scattered all over the city of Corinth. And they met in these small groups and there was freedom and responsibility to not only receive but to give. But as these groups started to grow, the need for order and focus, a focus on edification, would grow also. A larger group, and you can imagine, much less manageable, and therefore more likely to move to disorder and allow for confusion to enter in. And I think that's great support for things like home groups. It's great support for... Um, you can call it a home church if you want, but I, I, I always encourage those that feel like, well, you know, I want to invite other believers to my house. There's so much more that can go on in those small groups. We don't have that in a formal way in this church. I, I've encouraged before that if you feel led to start something in your home, that's fine. You know, 
Hopefully it's done in such a way that doesn't contradict what's happening here. Um, but, it, you know, we're so small as it is that we really don't, I don't think, need to push that right now. Um, although there has been talk in leadership about training up leaders for that, and especially if we ever get to the days that we can't meet like this, if they literally do shut the door and we can't open it again. Um, so that should be somewhat of our prayers and focus for the future. I don't know about you, if you've had the experience of being in a small group, a home group, I mean, it's so precious. I mean, I, I, I think I learned more in those first years as a Christian in a small group, in a home group, than I was learning in church. I mean, it's where I learned to pray. It's where I found freedom to worship. It's where I got to ask questions. You know, so there's something very special. And there is that freedom for things like we're reading about here, to let the gifts move. You know, because the larger the group gets, the more, as I said, unmanageable it seems to be. Look at verse 27. If anyone speaks in a tongue, let there be two or at the most three, each in turn, and let one interpret. But if there is no interpreter, let him keep silent in the church and let him speak to himself and to God. So from this, it's clear that Paul won't prohibit people speaking in tongues in a church meeting. Though we need to again remember he's primarily thinking of the smaller meetings, the house churches. He will not prohibit it, but if the tongue has an interpretation, there is a potential for blessing others. Yet he'll not, he's not discouraging it, he's not encouraging it, but if it moves, he's just setting up some rules. There needs to be an interpretation. And if tongues are going to be spoken, he says, let only two or three at the most speak in tongues. And he's saying, if you must speak in tongues at your church meeting, do not do much of it. I guess really what we would say is that Paul is saying, don't focus on tongues. And when exercised, do it each in turn. Now, I don't know if you've ever been to a meeting where people, multiple people, are all speaking in tongues at the same time. Um, There's a problem with that. There's definitely a problem with that. And I think Paul is laying out a case here that that would not be scriptural. And he's very, he leans very heavily on the interpretation. And he's saying, don't speak in tongues at all, even two or three at a time, even each in your turn, if you won't have an interpretation given. Now, some people split between what we call tongues and what some people call a prayer language. And some will say, well, you know, it's okay because it's not tongues, it's a prayer language. And I, I personally think that's a distinction that should not be made. Because if it's a tongue, it's a tongue. You know, whether, whether you're saying I'm exercising the gift of tongues or I'm speaking in my prayer language, it's still the same thing that we're talking about. And so to say, well, we're all, we can all speak, in, as long as it's a prayer language, we can all speak at the same time. I mean, I think Paul is drawing a line that that's not, <clears throat> not accurate. Now, one could ask about occasions where it seems that many spoke in tongues at the same time and without an interpretation, such as the day of Pentecost that we read about in Acts chapter 2. Well, we could say that in their enthusiasm and excitement, even on the day of Pentecost, they went beyond the scriptural order that Paul's teaching here. Of course, this teaching didn't come till later. And no harm seemed to come of it that day, let's be honest. But don't overlook that the unbelievers that heard them said what? They thought they were drunk. And so in a sense, that's kind of the same statement that Paul was making, that they're out of their mind. But also remember, they heard everything in a language they understood. So in a sense, in their speaking, God was also giving the interpretation. So there was an order there, even though at first it just seemed really odd to them that that this was going on because it was new. So bottom line for this section is if there's no interpreter, let that person keep silent in the church and let him speak to himself and to God. And I think the important thing there is in church. Because in a person's devotional life, you know, the tongue is welcome. You know, in a small meeting, as we've read here as an example, you know, as long as it's done with these these, um, instructions in mind, it's fine. 
But in a large church meeting, it just, it's just what he's saying is it would put things out of order. Look at verse 29. Let two or three prophets speak, and let the others judge. But if anything is revealed to another who sits by, let the first keep silent. For you can all prophesy one by one, that all may learn and all may be encouraged. And the spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophets. For God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, as in all the churches of the saints. So again, it's a matter of balance. It's a matter of order, and it's a caution against excess. And it says there, let the others judge. And that really makes me think of 1 John chapter 4, verse 1. It says, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. And then it says that the spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophets. I think this is extremely important because we have witnessed great, great excess in this area, especially if you've ever been enamored with uh, TV preaching and TV ministries. And the fact is, this means that the one who prophesied is not carried away. He's not carried away without his consent. It's not done against his will. And so he cannot evade the instructions of this chapter on the pretense that he just couldn't help himself. Because what this is saying is that he himself can determine when and how long he should speak. And that self-control was proof of God's leading. Self-control is listed, it's included in the fruit of the Spirit. That's something that the the Holy Spirit works in us as individuals and within a church body. And the bottom line in those verses, for God is not the author of confusion. And that word confusion means disorder or instability. No, God is a God of peace. And we can always use that as a litmus test. If we're in a situation and we recognize, we discern confusion, then we know something else is at work. Because God will not lead us there. He's not a God of confusion. There will be peace when he's at work. And the reason this is such a concern, we come back to that same topic, that all may learn and all may be encouraged, all be built up, all be edified. And that word encouraged there actually means comforted. Look at verse 34. If we're not controversial enough yet, Let your women keep silent in the churches, for they are not permitted to speak, but they are to be submissive, as the law also says. And if they want to learn something, let them ask their own husbands at home, for it is shameful for women to speak in church. I told you earlier, you need to have grace for me today. You need to have mercy for me today. Or I'll trade places with you. So Paul has already taught back in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 that women have the right to pray, women have the right to prophesy publicly. And so understand that. Here, Paul probably means that women should not judge prophecy, which is really something that's left up to the leadership, which is male in the church. And in the ancient world, just in some modern cultures, women and men sat in different groups in the church. And so the picture that we get sometimes is that women sitting separate from the men, there's a curiosity on their part. They're disrupting because they're trying to maybe speak to their husbands or they're talking amongst themselves and causing a disruption. But among these Christians in Corinth, there seems to have been a problem. That's why Paul is addressing it. Whether it was the women chattering or disrupting the meeting with questions, we don't know. But Paul is saying, don't disrupt the meeting. Ask your questions at home. And really, what I just described the best I could is supported by Paul's use of a very specific ancient Greek verb. And the verb is in, in the Greek is leleo, and which means to talk, to question, to argue, to profess, or to chatter. I mean, that's the word he used. So I think that's the picture we're getting. And if I seem to be moving away from those verses quickly, it's on purpose. Verse 36. Oh, I I addressed it. Verse 36. Or did the word of God come originally from you? 
or was it you only that it reached? If anyone thinks himself to be a prophet or spiritual, let him acknowledge that the things which I write to you are the commandments of the Lord. But if anyone is ignorant, let him be ignorant. So Paul starts off with a question, or did the word of God come originally from you? And, and if you've never noticed it before, Paul um, is very good at using sarcasm. He means what he's asking, but he's sometimes in a very sarcastic way. So Paul's asking them if the word of God only reached them. So he sees some pride, he sees possibly some arrogance on their part on how they're interpreting things and handling things. And he's probably heard because he's dealt with them in ways that we don't even have recorded. He, he knows their attitudes. But in other words, if the Corinthians professed to know more about these matters than Paul, he would ask them if they, as a church, produced the word of God or if they were the only ones who had received the word of God. So Paul addresses the attitudes he saw in these Corinthian believers. He challenges them on how they set themselves up as an official authority in these matters. But the facts are no church originated the word of God, and no church has exclusive rights to it. So Paul emphasizes that his instructions to the church are not his own ideas. They're not his own interpretations he states it clearly, these are the commandments of the Lord. And he's saying any man who is a prophet of the Lord or who is truly spiritual will acknowledge the truth in what he's saying. And this is a sufficient answer to those who insist that some of Paul's teachings, especially those concerning women, reflect his own prejudices. There's a lot of people that believe that, believe that Paul was some sort of misogynist. But these are not Paul's private views. They're the commandments of the Lord, as he stated. Of course, we see in Paul's writing also, some would not be willing to accept them as such, and so the apostle adds that if anyone is ignorant, let him be ignorant. And that seems kind of harsh. But actually, I think it's a good lesson for all of us. Because sometimes we just have to rest in the fact that there are those that will remain ignorant that will not accept our teaching, will not accept the truth, will continuously refute it. And I think that comes back to the image of casting our pearls before swine. We just have to realize there's sometimes we're not going to get through to people. And that's okay. That's not on you. That's on them. You know, you continue to pray for them. If you get another opportunity to share, then share. But just realize there, are, there, are, there do come times where we need for our own peace to move on and let what we've already speaking do its own work with the Holy Spirit's power behind it. Verse 39, Therefore, brethren, desire earnestly to prophesy and do not forbid to speak with tongues. Let all things be done decently and in order. So desire earnestly. We were told earlier to, to desire the best gifts, and I still think that description is the best gifts for the moment. What gifts do I need right now to minister, to be what God's called me out to be? Desire those gifts that God would give them to you so that you can minister in his power. And do not forbid the gift of tongues. Paul's not forbidding it. He's setting an order to it all. So decently and in order. I want us to really understand what Paul is saying there as we end this chapter. The Greek word translated as decently is only found two other times in the New Testament. Romans 13.13 13 and 1 Thessalonians 4.12. In both places, it means to do something honestly or to walk honestly. Further, it's understood as something that is done properly as opposed to improperly. It has to do with the intent and the motivation more than the outward action. So it's something that starts within, and it becomes an action. Because a good intention that begins in the heart and the mind will always result in the right action. Now, the word order in the Greek, it's the word taxis. And it carries the idea of something done in a fitting way, or something done according to order. Now, some of you are familiar with the Jewish historian Josephus. 
We learn a lot about history through Josephus. And he used the word taxes when he recorded the way which the Roman army erected their camps, indicating their camps were orderly, organized, and well-planned. The commanders didn't engage in last-minute planning. Their camps were not hastily thrown together, but rather set up in an organized and thoughtful manner. So we get a very rich picture of what that word means there. And Josephus also used the word taxis to describe the way the Essene Jews were respectful to others. That sect of Judaism, the Essenes, would wait very purposely until others were finished speaking before they would take their turn and speak out. And in Josephus' depiction of this behavior amongst the Essenes, he used the word taxis to picture people who were respectful, deferential, courteous, accommodating, well-mannered, and polite. So you see there's, there's a deep meaning to what's being said here. It really speaks to the conduct that we are to have as a body of believers, how we're to treat one another with that respect that really only comes from God's influence in us, not from our human nature. So taking these meanings into account, 1 Corinthians 14 verse 40 that we just read could be translated like this. Let everything be done in a fitting and proper manner that is organized, well-planned, respectful, well-mannered, and polite. Now, that doesn't mean that worship needs to be rigid and stale. Because right away when you start talking about this, I know that word that bubbles up in a lot of us, and that's religion. You know, we don't want religion. We don't want it to be about religiosity. We don't, we don't want to be stale. We don't want to be legalistic about what we do. But this doesn't mean that worship needs to be rigid and stale. Actually, it means the opposite. As long as our worship is decent and orderly, we have great freedom to worship God however we're led. And that's always my prayer for you, that you would know that you can worship God as you're led as long as it's decent and within order. And everything God does, everything God has given us is decent and in order. And the great thing about that is when we follow that decency and we follow that order, things go well with us. And listen, don't be offended or shocked if others worship God differently than you do. That's okay too. We don't all have to look alike. We don't have to look alike in our worship. We just need to look at the same thing when we worship, the same God when we worship, and understand his ways of getting it done. Whew. Glad that chapter's over. 40 verses, which is usually the number of judgment in Scripture. Hmm? Or lashes. <clears throat> worship can come back up and Ushers, come forward. You know, we come to our communion time as we do every Sunday. And you just think about the work that Jesus came to do and how it's just another picture of God's perfect order. It wasn't just a last-minute thought that Jesus would come and die for our sins. It wasn't just a last-minute thought that he would raise from the grave on the third day. As a matter of fact, we go all the way back to the beginning, the third chapter of the very first book of our scripture, Genesis 3, verse 15. And there, God first said, right after man fell in the garden, he said right there that I'm going to come I'm going to step into time, and I'm going to rescue you from yourself. If by faith you believe in me, I will apply my grace to you, and I will take you the rest of the way and bring you home someday. And so from the very beginning, God has set things into an order. Man has messed with it. Man has done his best to dis, dis, or throw it off the rails. And sometimes we think we're being successful messing up his plan, but his plan will always come to fruition. And so when we come to the communion table, we realize that we are celebrating 
something that God said he would do from the very beginning. He said he would come and he would die. And by the shedding of his blood, we would have the remission of our sins. By the torture on that cross, we would be made whole. That we would share in his resurrection. We would share in the death and ultimately in that new life. And so, as I always say, don't take this casually. Don't take this casually because this is an opportunity for you to celebrate what he did for you and to just spend that time, as the word says, communing with him. So I just pray that you would find joy in this as you consider, as you remember. And Father, we do remember. We remember that you sent your only begotten, Lord, because you loved us so much that you wanted to gain us back in to your kingdom to spend eternity with you. Lord, we don't quite understand that kind of love, and we don't really know how to return it, but the best that we can, Lord, we just express our love for you, our thanksgiving for what you did, and in that, Lord, giving you all the honor and glory that you deserve. And so, Lord, we take this time now to remember, to consider, to celebrate what you did for us, what it cost you to purchase us. And we do that in Jesus' name.